Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Derek Ramsey. I am the moderator for this session. Uh, this presentation is course design is key, melding solid teaching principles with flexible and powerful technology, and will be presented by Dave Eveland. With over 15 years of instructional design experience and 10 years of teaching experience, Dave Eveland holds a master's degree in holistic education from Johnson University and an educational specialist in higher education leadership and management from Regent University. His experience in both IT and higher ed provides an experienced perspective in how to address the challenges of instructional design today, including experience using QM and OSCQR frameworks. He currently assists with development and building processes of online courses, consults faculty on teaching and learning best practice, explores and recommends technology solutions to instructional problems, and assists in the management of the LMS. He also facilitates two orientation courses one for faculty and one for students new to online instruction and learning. Please remember to mute yourself if you are not speaking to avoid distraction without growing noise. We have set the rooms to mute participants upon entry, but all attendees do have the ability to unmute themselves in order to speak or ask a question. Uh, be sure to go ahead and double check if you are muted now. Also, we ask that you leave your webcam off unless you are speaking. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them into the chat. You can, e you can enter questions at any time. We'll either address them during the session or after. We'll let Dave uh, determine how he wants to answer those presenters' choice. And uh, once again, this session is being recorded. will be available at a later date on the Sakai YouTube channel. If you have any problems with video or audio throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to message me directly in chat or post in the chat, and we'll work with you to get that resolved. Dave? Thank you very much, Derek. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to all the attendees here today, uh, to the conference organizers and to the Aperio Foundation um, and other supporters of the, uh, the Sakai Virtual Conference. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've attended the Sakai Virtual Conference for a number of years and it's always there's always something to be learned and uh, new and exciting things. And honestly, those lightning talks, um, I don't know if anybody had the chance to get into those lightning talks either this morning or earlier this afternoon, but they're like the best nuggets of powerful takeaways from the SVC sometimes. Um, and in some ways, those ideas really help to meld solid teaching techniques uh, and principles with powerful and really flexible technology. Um, so today I want to have more of a discussion than just simply me being a talking box um, and uh, then to present uh, things uh, we already know. Um, despite the needs and finding surface by more the more recent global crisis um, that we are all, I think, familiar with, and even now, uh, how we continue to learn new lessons from it. Um, it remains important for us to hold uh, and understand our students uh, and develop courses and programs with solid, really course, uh, really good solid course development techniques. So one of the things that I want to kind of do here is uh, I want to start start off here um, with uh, a question, um, and I want everyone to respond to the question. Um, okay. Um, now, if you're in a place where you don't have access to the chat window, then just kind of keep your answer to yourself and you know try ESP it to us or something. But I want you to use text in the chat window. But there's a catch. Okay. So I do not want you to hit enter or return until I have counted down to ten. Okay. I will try and give everyone about 60 or 30 to 60 seconds to compose your answer. Um, and you can put that in another text window, um, or if you want to compose it in the chat window and, or paste it into the chat window from another window. But just make sure you do not hit enter until I've counted down to one from 10 allowed. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. So um, we basically are looking to try and see if we can't have everybody's answers come into that chat window sort of all at once. Okay. So here's the question. I'm going to sort of preface the question with this. Now, I know this question can be pretty divisive, um, uh, especially around my family and it's, anyways, and, and it's always one that garners quite a bit of argument with some of my friends. And I know what you're thinking. Some have even thought it's sort of a, a hill to die on. But me, well, let, let's just get on to the question. Okay, so does everybody seem to understand? Hopefully, remember, don't hit enter on your response until I've counted down from 10. So uh, you guys will compose your answer and then I will say, okay, it's been about 30 or 60 seconds. Now I will count down to 10. And when I get to one, I want everybody to hit the enter key and have your, uh, your response show up in that chat window, okay? So um, I'll count down from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, and then when I go, get to one, everybody hit your enter key at the same time, okay? I'm sure it's not gonna make big blue button blow up or anything else like that, so. All right, so ready for the question? Okay, so here's our question. To read it out loud, how do you feel about pineapple on pizza? 
So uh, I'll set my timer here for about uh, 60 seconds. And so you've got about 60 seconds. Now remember, do not put your answer into, uh, I'll repeat the question. Thank you, Terry. How do you feel about pineapple on pizza? So about uh, 45 to 30 seconds, compose your answer. Don't hit enter yet, don't hit enter just yet. Okay. I know some of you are thinking, where in the world is this going? This has nothing to do with pedagogy and melding solid technologies together. Okay, we got about uh, 30 seconds left. Okay, now remember, do not put your, do not hit the enter key until you hear me actually count down from 10, okay? Um, you've got about, uh, you've got about five seconds left, and then I will tell everybody that we will count down from 10. So don't put it, don't, don't hit enter yet, okay? Okay, so timer's gone off, and hold on, hold on. I will count down from 10. Hopefully you've got your, your answer, and you've composed it, and you're putting it in the chat window, but don't hit enter just yet, okay? And now I will go ahead and count down. I will count down from 10, and when I get to zero, everybody hit your enter key, okay? So here we go. 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so we've got lots of people saying some things in the chat area in terms of what they have a preference for. We've got some people that happen to say, I love it on pizza. Cindy says, I actually like it sometimes. The contrast between sweet, tart, and salty is good. It's a change from typical pizza flavors. Uh, Mark says, cautious. Um, Desiree says, love it. Um, Jamie Lynn says delicious. Sherry Howard says pineapple on pizza is delicious, but only if there's some kind of cured meat to go with it. Um, Jeannie ha uh, Janine Hagen uh, Higgins, excuse me, pineapple is good. Cheese, not so much. Um, Danny B says I'd rather not. Jeremy says it's a must, gotta have it. Um, Bill says delightfully exotic. Uh, Kathleen says excellent. Uh, ben says it's fine if there's uh, also ham or bacon. So it's sort of that uh, other theme that we saw before. Aaron says sin. Um, Alan says dislike. So they seem like they're in agreement. Abomination. Wow. Um, Jesus says, uh, oh no. And Nikki says positively. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, hopefully you all got to sort of see everybody's response. And it's very interesting about the fact that um, everyone's response was somewhat around the same sort of, we all dressed the same thing, pizza and pineapple but we all didn't have exactly the same sort of preference or the same exact fit uh, and the fit for that particular thing uh, when it comes to that particular thing that we would eat, okay? And hopefully you're gonna see some of those things sort of work themselves out in terms of how course development and melding technology works in terms of fit. In some cases, it does come down to a preference and in some other cases, it may actually come down to whether or not these are a very good fit for what we're trying to accomplish with our students in terms of the outcomes and the way in which we're trying to accomplish those outcomes, okay? Um, hopefully that kind of, <laughs> it seems like everybody seemed to have an opinion, which was good. I, I wasn't sure if I should ask that or if I should ask about what flavor of ice cream everybody likes, uh, but we'll uh, move on here. So instructional design, uh, and I think some of uh, you, I, I started to ask the question too, how many of our instructional designers, staff, faculty, administrators, developers, um, but I think we've got a good swath of people here in this. But instructional design, according to uh, Piskarich, really sort of boils down, or at least they say, it boils down to the basics um, and is simply a process of helping create effective training in an efficient manner. I think this process is really nuanced, right? Um, but, uh, but likely similar across a lot of our campuses and institutions. Um, and I want to take a moment to ask, um, uh, how do you develop courses where you are? Now, this is we're not going to do the, the, the chat waterfall thing in this particular case, but I, I want to be asking that question about how do you develop courses with where you are at your institution, at your organization, whether it's a nonprofit or it's a higher education institution, how do you do those courses and how you develop those courses? Uh, because in some cases, what we have to do is we have to look at what we're doing and see if there are ways in which that process um, and that protocol can be improved. Um, and in some cases, maybe we've done that, but I would also like to inject that um, we've also had this huge global pandemic come through. Um, and perhaps that pandemic has provided some sort of some fodder, honestly, for us to figure out what is it we're doing well 
what is it we need to change as a result of maybe the way students have perceived um, how those courses are developed and delivered uh, to them, whether it's online, face-to-face, -face, or hybrid or high flex. Um, and so let me let me sort of ply through some of these sort of questions um, and just kind of get you to a place where you're sort of thinking a little bit more about this overall question about how, how do you develop courses with where you are? And then later, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and share some things as far as uh, how we develop courses with where I am, um, but also some other best practices uh, um, that I've come across and, and things that I have to share. Um, and as you have questions, please do go ahead and put them in the chat window. Um, we won't do the whole everybody wait and until the end to put your questions in. So feel free to put your questions there, and we'll try and address those um, uh, probably sometime toward the end. Okay. Um, so. Here are a few questions to consider, um, and, and I think we could spend, honestly, the rest of the time just talking about these. And I think discussions are really good to have, um, rather than just simply a talking head. Um, and I would encourage you to have these conversations with others, um, and particularly, specifically, with people not necessarily at your institution. It's, it's good to have conversations with people at your institution, um, but sometimes we can get so sort of focused on where we are uh, that we have a hard time sort of looking up from what we're doing. And honestly, the pandemic's done that in many cases, I think. Um, it's made us all sort of focus and heads down and try to get things done. Um, but I think at some point, we also have to come up to breathe uh, and see what other people are doing. Not because we're looking to compare, but we're looking to see what is it we haven't been able to notice um, and that can help improve our processes and times. So here you can see on the screen, I've got a couple of questions that I was just trying to sort of ask. Um, and I've got to sort of uh, blow this up just a little bit for myself so I can see those questions um, since I actually didn't make them nearly as large as I wanted to. I know uh, folks like uh, Terry Golightly are saying that text is way too small. So some of the questions to think about um, are who's tasked with the course development? So on your institution or in your organization, who is tasked with doing the, the course development? Um, is it is it only online courses that receive a course development treatment? Um, I think uh, in my earlier instructional design days, um, there was a lot of times when what I was doing was simply doing online course development and that was it. Um, but it, it took a couple of years until a lot of our processes looked to develop online courses and then port those online courses to the face-to-face -face offering um, and essentially provided some level of continuity and consistency across those courses. But, you know, is, 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 on, is, is course development only for online courses or hybrid courses or, or, or high flex courses maybe? Um, what resources are needed when developing uh, on, uh, a new course? Um, you know, uh, uh, are there resources that you bring to bear in terms of time, money, people, and, uh, and uh, perhaps even an overall management or project management software? I was going through some uh, other professional development earlier this year that talked about, hey, you've really got to have a project management software platform. And um, I was in a listserv um, with uh, Educause um, uh, in, during that, that part of the year. And there was a lot of institutions that, yeah, we don't actually have a project management software or we use Asana or um, we're using um, uh, Basecamp or we're using uh, some other things. Or some other people were saying we're using Microsoft um, Project. Other people were saying we have a, we have a spreadsheet <laughs> and that's what they use. Um, so. Other questions like what kind of timeline do you use uh, when developing your courses? Uh, is it just, you know, there's, it doesn't matter how long it, it takes. Do you have a specific timeline? Um, is that timeline uh, somewhat dependent upon whether or not the course um, has enough people to register for the course? Um, um, maybe that's dependent upon when and how often you offer that course or whether or not someone wants to design the course uh, as, a, as a course that's offered um, that uses uh, that development process or not. Um, what, if anything, this is a really good question, I think, what, if anything, has changed as a result of the pandemic and how you develop and deliver courses? Um, you know, I, I think in many cases prior to the pandemic, a lot of instructional designers like me would have liked to have gone through and said, there is so much that we have to offer by way of development and making things better, higher quality, greater consistency, um, higher continuity, uh, better outcomes. Um, and yet we don't have people asking us about these questions. And now with the pandemic, there is massive amount of questions. Um, uh, so many of the instructional designers that I've talked to are just in some ways either spinning from um, and still trying to come out of the depths of trying to figure out you know, how they were trying to do things uh, during those pandemic days. Um, and even, even as we sort of come out of those, some of the questions uh, still are, you know, are we gonna go back to what we were doing before? Um, will what we've been able to accomplish continue to persist? Um, and I think there's a lot of space and, and history will probably discover and tell whether or not those things have changed um, and, and how they're going to change too. And then uh, another question, have you taken into consideration how students dispositions of, uh, have changed in light of the pandemic process. Um, I remember early on in the pandemic process, one of the biggest questions that I had was, 
And I remember, and I think Terry, uh, Terry Golightly, who I work with, um, uh, I remember telling uh, her, I think in an email, I said, I want to make sure that all of our students understand that this sort of emergency move because of the pandemic is not what we would normally consider the quality online development process. Um, and in some cases, I guess I was a little bit uh, uh, concerned about people seeing what was happening and judging, oh, if this is just online, then students would, instead of looking to online as a way of, uh, of getting their courses uh, completed and, and finishing their program step would completely avoid it. Um, because we obviously, uh, at least from our standpoint, we do not pull, pour in the same sort of quality and development process in our face-to-face -face courses as we do in our online courses. Now, it's not to say our face-to-face -face courses are not quality. Uh, they are, uh, but they go through a different sort of process. And I'm not nearly as informed about what that process looks like. So just some questions to kind of think about. Um, does anybody have any comments at the moment uh, to kind of share? Okay, we're still with pineapple. Okay. Okay. All right. So when it comes to course development, then uh, there are course there are of course lots of tools out there to consider, um, and that includes lots of models uh, like the Addy model. I'm, I assume that a lot of people are familiar with the Addy model, where you've got you know you uh, you go through an analysis, design, uh, development, implementation, and evaluation um, of that whole process. Um, and uh, uh, there's also the TPAC model, uh, which is uh, more popular. Um, uh, uh, Back, uh, going back about five, uh, five to eight years um, in terms of its generation. There's the backward design model, which I happen to be a pretty big fan of. Um, that's uh, forwarded really by Wiggins and McTee. Um, that's the idea of beginning with the end in mind, um, right? And, and I think in some cases, um, there's a lot of centrist movement in there in that area um, with, with, uh, with trying to figure out if we want our students to do something, then how do we know that they're going to be able to do it at the end? And maybe we need to figure out what that looks like. Um, and of course, there's lots of other uh, models that are out there. Um, just kind of curious, and you can put this in the chat. We're not going to do that whole enter thing, but are there other, mo other models that you have used? Um, and, and, and which of those models maybe have you found most relevant um, or which that you have attempted but maybe left to go by the wayside? Um, and you can just kind of go ahead and put those in uh, the chat area because I'm kind of curious. Um, now I would say um, my own institution uses somewhat of the, the Wiggins and McTee uh, sort of backward design model, not explicitly and exclusively, um, but uh, but we also sort of, we look at that whole prospect and aspect and try and make it fit for our own institution. Um, so I got a couple of other people uh, that were typing in terms of offering some other I uh, models that they use. Um, I know this is not exactly an instructional design model, but um, some folks will use a scrum model uh, in terms of a scrum context or organizational construct in terms of coming up with their courses um, and doing their development. Um, others, um, if you're in project management or you're familiar with project management administrators, um, you might be more familiar with the waterfall uh, function of, hey, we just, we dig all in, we just go over it, we, we just go from the first part to the last part, um, and that's how we do things. Um, and of course, that, that can be uh, enumerated in other ways too. Um, so there's also not just those models of instructional design, but there's also learning and instructional design theory um, to consider. And this sort of goes all the way back to Skinner and behaviorism, and there's Kraftwall's revision of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, I've, I've, I remember talking to a lot of folks um, about the fact that Bloom's is not the only taxonomy. There's not the only theory of learning there is. And that's true. Um, you know, the way that we th see things is not completely through a single theory. And we can't begin to expect that our students, when they come to our courses, even if we're leveraging that theory, um, are going to necessarily buy into, or even, of course, they're not even going to be aware of what the theory is. Um, but we're trying to sort of divine uh, and design, divine, design our courses in such a way that they catch our students and hopefully all of our students so that we can deliver them to the end, hopefully, of our course, uh, not just in in time, but also with a level of skill and understanding as a result of the course. And there's also uh, a D thinks uh, more recent concept of significant learning, which uh, either borrows or sort of builds a little bit on Bloom's taxonomy. If you're not familiar with D think, um, he's got some very interesting ideas that sort of has uh, this idea of caring and application and human dimension integration, uh, along with those other aspects of Bloom's taxonomy um, that are aspects of how he defines what significant learning is. Um, so um, we're going to add to this mix then. Um, so if we're trying to sort of step back and you're sort of someone who's trying to come up with this pizza 
and you're thinking, okay, I've got all these toppings and all this other stuff. Well, I've got uh, I've got models that I can use. I've got theory that I can use. Well, also there's also this technology, okay? So there's all sorts of technologies that I can leverage as part of the way I teach my course, whether it's a face-to-face -face course, an online course, or some other method, right? Um, and so we add to this mix of technologies, the disposal of any number of wired or wireless devices, uh, the internet inside and outside the classroom, there's conferencing software like Big Blue Button, Zoom, and others, and the more recent releases of uh, platforms like Class and InSpace, uh, which really look to humanize and socialize the virtual meeting space. Um, uh, uh, we're not using those, but I've seen a couple of demos of both of those uh, products that sort of build on what Zoom does and what other conferencing uh, platforms do. Um, and, and, and in a way to try and seek to humanize what we're doing, especially if we have students that are uh, you know, doing uh, class from a distance or they're uh, contact traced or they're just choosing not to come to class because it's allowed. Um, and so they're just doing class from their dorm room or from their home. And of course, there's also, <laughs> without question, the learning management system. Um, and I'm thinking keenly here of Sakai um, and how well it plays with the LTI tools. Um, if you didn't get the chance to hear um, the session from over at the uh, University of Dayton and the Lightning Sessions, some of the things that they're doing with the LTI and Sugi tools are just really, really amazing. Uh, in terms of bringing along what we can do, not just inside of Sakai, but uh, as a leveraged tool uh, within inside of Sakai. And of course, there's a long growing list of other technologies like H5P, which allows you to create um, um, learning, uh, learning uh, activities and tasks, um, Xerti, which is very similar, uh, and of course, there's others as well. So we've got all this mix of things, right? We got all this mix of things, but then we also have to consider, and I think this is becoming more and more relevant with regard to course development. Um, that idea that uh, there's the modality to consider. Um, um, if your institution isn't doing anything online, um, I think I remember reading an EDUCAUSE uh, or a higher ed article about, um, I guess it was about two years ago. And it was interesting because right before the pandemic, um, and it said, if you're not into online or you're not doing online, then you should have started 10 years ago. Um, and uh, it was interesting because then we jumped right into pandemic um, and it was like, how in the world are we going to do this? Um, but has your institution also considered different types of offerings as a result of the pandemic? Um, uh, there are online strategies, are there online strategies and methods that could work for face-to-face -face context? So things you're doing online that actually might translate well to a face-to-face -face context. Um, and of course, I think there's a lot of people that know there's lots of things in face-to-face -face context that do not translate nearly as easily or adaptively to an online context. Um, I've been working somewhat with our, our, our science department and trying to figure out how do we, how do we get those um, science experiments to work for our students? Do we need to send them kits? Well, there are organizations that actually create those kits, but then those kits tend to be very expensive. Uh, but then there's also um, sort of uh, sim uh, simulations and other sorts of uh, models that students can manipulate that are actually online um, that can actually be linked to or otherwise included inside the LMS that actually might work. Um, a question to consider is, is anyone even considering what's called HyFlex? Um, I think we've heard of HyFlex for a while, but it's the idea that courses are offered in a way that reach both students who wanted to learn on campus and students who need remote or online access due to quarantine requirements or because they just felt more comfortable remaining at home um, while continuing their, their work. Um, it'll be very interesting in the next couple of years to find out if we have a, a large number of students, which itself is considerably dwindling um, based on, you know, the, uh, the, re the, the recession of 2008 and the, the lowered birth rate um, and, and just the number of students at our disposal, uh, not our disposal, that's not the best way to say it, but at our, um, uh, you know, who may want to come to our institution um, and, and the fact that we may actually have to sort of really change how we're going to address and, uh, uh, and provide education to them in a higher education context. And I think all of this has to come into play when we're doing our course development, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whatever, whatever the modality happens to be. And so um, the other thing to consider then is, of course, our students. And you would like to think, well, we should consider our students uh, first. Um, but I think there's some place to say that all of these other things, modality and technology and uh, um, the, uh, the other aspects, theory and models, all of those things have a, a place to play um, in, in what we try and offer to our students. Um, but, but, but several years ago, um, here at my institution, we, we sort of re-examined uh, who we were designing our online courses for, um, and this was before the pandemic. Um, and we were designing them for students, but we were designing them for students who likely fell between the ages primarily of 20 and 25. Um, and we quickly discovered that many just out of high school students uh, wanted to take our online courses uh, in conjunction with our face-to-face -face offerings, and they found that the online courses that we offered, and ours are seven weeks long, 
total. Um, and so we can offer uh, six sessions of, uh, of seven week courses a year. Um, so that provides some mechanism of finishing a degree uh, within a certain amount of time. That pace can be really maddening. Uh, and uh, quite often, those students coming right out of high school, um, they really lack the time management and self-discipline skills um, for the online courses. Um, and the older students that took those courses um, really seem to have no problem with them, or at least fewer issues when it came to time management and, uh, and engaging in the courses. There was a recent EDUCAUSE report um, that found in light of the pandemic that students really took to learning anywhere and at any time. Uh, and partially that's because of exactly what the pandemic happened, uh, you know, caused, but it's also opened the eyes of some students to see, oh, wow, if this is how I can do school, then what does that mean for how I go forward with school? Does it mean I don't go to school anymore? Or does it mean that maybe if I didn't want to do online courses, now I know that this is kind of what it might be like, and I think I can do it. But then you also have some students that have examined that and seen, oh, maybe I really want to be in face-to-face -face courses. But I think that also means to say that we actually need to be very intentional in all of our offerings to make course development really, really key in terms of what we're doing. So the report also found that students loved the opportunity to get back into course content. Um, so this would be the idea of seeing recorded lectures or seeing that content. I mean, not necessarily removing the instructor. As a matter of fact, um, uh, this would just simply be a, a key strength of what we can do inside the LMS uh, is putting that content there in an organized fashion that makes sense uh, for students to sort of work through those things. Um, if you haven't had a chance to actually read through the EDUCAUSE ECAR reports uh, for this year, um, I think there's still some very strong lessons outside of this presentation to be learned. Um, so um, if you get just Google ECAR report for 2021 from EDUCAUSE, that's a really, it's a long read, but it's a, it's a really, really good read. And they, they got some good key points that they can uh, point out in there. Um, so the other thing with all of this great stuff, um, how how could there be any problems? We've got all this, you know, I like to think about this, <laughs> the way that my, my kids like to think about how they would, uh, um, we, we used to go to a restaurant and they had like 13 different soda uh, flavors. Um, and, you know, you could get your cup and then all of a sudden once you get your cup, then, you know, you could get any flavor that you want of soda. Well, my kids all thought it was fantastic when they got to get Fanta or Cherry Coke. Um, and I would get it for them. But then when I released them to say, hey, go get your own, they thought it was really neat to go through and start mixing all these things. Well, um, uh, I'm not necessarily as educated on mixed drinks, but I think there's a limit to which other things and all that stuff needs to come in and have the outcome still be good. So I think in, in light of all these things, we could just simply pour them all together and say, well, this is what we need to do. But I think the outcome would be poor. And I think there needs to be some strategic, well-informed, uh, uh, strategic decision-making on the part of uh, faculty, instructors, instructional designers, administrators, um, and, and perhaps a whole uh, sort of cadre of people to inform how we do instructional design and specifically at your institution and in your case. Um, there's no doubt gonna be problems. Uh, there was, a, uh, this is just actually from that uh, EDUCAUSE uh, report that said, a student, as it was during the pandemic, said, I hate that the instructor doesn't really understand problems technology can have happen. Um, he says, uh, I heard a lot of stories about people getting points off for attendance because of campus connectivity issues. You know, those sorts of aspects that aren't taken into consideration when doing online course development, or perhaps even just simply helping faculty understand when you're doing development, that's good, but you also have to realize the people that you're dealing with are people. They're humans. Life happens um, in, a, in a way the pandemic happened right to the entire world. And so we have to remember that we're not just teaching, we're not teaching robots, we're teaching students. And those students are, are humans, so just like we are. Um, and in fact, uh, just before I got onto this session, I actually had a uh, I had to get my son, uh, sorry, I had to get my daughter onto a Zoom session with a local meteorologist with her homeschool co-op, and it was giving problems for us logging in. It was just a mess. Uh, we finally figured it out, but it took a while. Um, but those, those sorts of things that we need to sort of figure out and, and sort of work through as part of that whole development process, you know, how can we do that? So let me just kind of describe our process here. I know we we're getting short on time here. I want to get through this really quickly to provide some other opportunities for people to share. We use an 18-week development process for online courses, uh, which seems more like 20 weeks. I've got that sort of in this, this table here. But this work is done in coordination with individual school departments and offering the courses that we do. Uh, and the process can normally take longer or shorter, depending upon the course itself. Uh, but we aim to try and put that together in sort of uh, an 18-week minimum process. Um, we leverage uh, internally generated resources, including a few sites that we actually have inside of our Sakai instance. Uh, the course development guide is something we've internally generated that has a whole lot of uh, really supportive uh, information for our faculty developers, uh, sorry, our, our, our uh, subject matter experts and, uh, and our developers. Um, uh, there's a document that we call affectionately the CD-WAM, 
which is the course development worksheet and alignment matrix. Um, and if it sounds like a matrix, it is a matrix. It actually has three matrices in them. Um, and uh, I have to give uh, good credit to our, our, our uh, 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 VP of online, uh, John Ketchen, who developed that many, many years ago. And it's worked and served us really, really, really well. Um, we also assign an instructional designer to work one-on-one -on -one with our course developer, our SME. As part of that process, uh, uh, I think back a couple of years ago, our original goal was to basically get our faculty or our SMEs through this thing and then release them into the LMS um, and say, go develop it. Um, and that worked for a little while, but we found that we had lack of consistency in the courses. Of course, we we also are trying to come up uh, uh, and, and address some accessibility issues, and we just could not uh, you know, teach our, our SMEs all of those set of skills. And so part of our process then involves helping the SME really simply go through and develop the course outside of the, the learning management system and really structure and think about what it is they want their students to know or do by the end of the course. And then we assist them with that build process. And in some cases, we'll do the entire build process um, because we can leverage some of that consistency um, across the courses. Um, we use several different tools. Um, so in thinking about um, some of those models and theories and everything else, and some of this is informed by some of those things, um, we, we generally keep our courses pretty consistent. Not all of our courses use all the tools. Um, I remember when we first got into using uh, online courses and those sorts of things, it seemed like everybody used every single tool. Um, we use a template now, um, and that template really helps to drive consistency uh, across most of our courses. Um, uh, if you don't use plan to use the tool, that you know, just don't 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 include it. Um, uh, we love the discussions tool inside of Sakai. Um, uh, it could use with some improvement. I hear that's uh, that's being developed in some cases. I don't know if there was a lightning talk on that. Um, we've even used Yellow Dig and some of our business courses, um, primarily because it helps connect students to content and students to other students uh, and to the content experts. Uh, this sort of triple play, if you will, helps to get students engaged with the subject at hand. And if you're using some of those techniques, Will mentioned earlier, um, I bet they're even better uh, if you're using some of those techniques from the discussion lightning uh, session that she, or actually she did a full session. Uh, so if you didn't see that session or, or do that, uh, definitely uh, check into that. So here are a few of the other course design ideas that seem important. I want to try and see if we can get some feedback from others uh, before the session ends. Um, hey, uh, what time does the session end? Does anybody want to chime in and tell me? You have, you have another 20 minutes. Okay, great. I want to make sure we had some time for feedback and folks. Um, so here's another other few course design ideas that seem important uh, and have come up over the years, uh, particularly with outcomes. And uh, we do them at the course level and at the unit lesson or module level. Um, that seems like it's a whole lot of uh, redundancy, um, but but we we actually ask our, our SMEs to go through and develop outcomes that are for the overall course. Um, and then at each of the units, so our courses are general, are all seven weeks long. And so you might have a seven week course that has seven units. And so we have our SMEs, our subject matter experts, work with our, our, our instructional design staff to go through and develop outcomes that are supportive in each of those weeks of the overall course uh, the course outcomes. And so we link those together. And that's actually enumerated inside of our CD WAM. And part of the reason for doing that is to say this particular activity, this particular um, thing that the students are doing is supported by this particular outcome. And that outcome um, supports the overall course outcome. And in fact, we even have a third matrix inside of that CD WAM that actually says that particular thing that the students do helps to support this overall program level outcome for that particular degree. Um, if you're not, uh, and uh, so if you're not familiar with quality matters, uh, if you've not looked into quality matters or literature on alignment, alignment is 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 really really key. In a nutshell, alignment is about making sure uh, what students need to know or be able to do is in line with the mechanisms uh, that should deliver them to that end. Um, so, you know, if 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 you in, if if you intend students to delve into deep discussion of of race and and equity issues, uh, a paper may not be the best place to begin. Uh, maybe it's a good place to go, um, but maybe you start with a discussion and lay down the ground rules and expectations and also provide some modeling, uh, perhaps. And if you want to get a sense of what students think about race and equity initially, where are they beginning? Where are their thinking? Where's their thinking come from? Uh, how has how has their own life experience shaped them? Perhaps providing an article in which they can annotate, maybe using uh, perusal or hypothesis, could be an initial way to go, uh, making the notations perhaps anonymous, um, and then use uh, that as a discussion starting place uh, for uh, an actual broader discussion, say in Zoom or Big Blue Button. 
Um, and then, you know, use that as another uh, great idea. Um, uh, oh, another great idea I wanted to mention too is just using an outcomes or tasks table. Um, so that's what I actually have on the screen here. That's an outcomes and tasks table, um, where essentially you have those set of key assignments or tasks uh, or activities in the course, and those are aligned and specified. This goes with this particular outcome. And so students can not only know those activities goes with those outcomes, but they, it answers that question, why do I have to do this? Well, you're doing this because that helps you to actually accomplish this particular thing. Um, I would like to see if we can't, this is something I'm trying to sort of think about in the future for our own and courses, is to actually create these sort of tables inside of our courses. Um, uh, years ago, I took a Quality Matters uh, set of courses, and they have that for every one of their modules, or at least they did at the time. And it really helped because it said to me, this is why you're doing this. And so I had fewer questions about the, the, uh, the, the applicability of why I was doing those things. So I kind of want to go through and sort of ask, um, so what other significant tips would you offer to those that are in attendance today? I can't, I can't mention everything. There's, there's a huge amount of things that are out there. Um, uh, and I know I have probably missed a lot. In fact, I wasn't trying to uh, cover all of them. Uh, but in just a second, we're going to do just that. And so you're going to get the chance to do that waterfall thing again. So every one of us, uh, yes, even if you are behind a screen, which I think everybody's behind a screen or in front of a screen, maybe. Um, only we'll do this in the same way that we did the waterfall. So I want you to compose your sort suggestion, uh, some sort of uh, tip or some sort of uh, specific idea that, that has really helped you or you've heard from someone else. Um, and you can do it in the chat window, just be careful, don't hit enter. And then my hope is we're gonna see this waterfall again, okay? And perhaps in some ways, like whether or not people have a preference for pineapple on pizza or not, this will actually sort of stitch together some ideas about, oh, well, I hadn't thought about it that way. I guess I could be okay with that if it comes with this. You know, um, I could be okay with pineapple on something if there's a protein on there. It's got to be a protein of this sort of set. But if it's just pineapple by itself, not so much. Um, you know, maybe there's a space in which these instructional design principles about building, developing courses, working with other people, having specific structures in place are beneficial. And we may not necessarily know them, but my hope is you're going to be able to compose that and put it in the window. So. So just like we did before, if you haven't had the chance to, uh, go ahead and compose that either in the chat window or in another offline editor or text area. And then I'm gonna count down to, uh, from no, roughly 10, um, and then we'll put those in there. So I'm gonna give everybody 60 seconds. It's gonna be 60, well, we'll give it 60 seconds, yeah, uh, of time uh, for everybody to compose those. And at the end of the 60 seconds, I'll announce that I'm gonna count down from 10 to zero. And at that point, I want everybody here uh, to enter, uh, hit the enter keys and share your idea. Okay, so hopefully we're ready. Hopefully we're getting some things to think about. And there might be some things that I've mentioned that are just really, really key for you. Well, you can go ahead and still mention those. Um, maybe it's just that much more important. Uh, maybe you could actually think of this question more so as, what's the one thing you need to do that has to be done? What's the one thing to avoid? Um, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the biggest uh, mistake that you could make, perhaps? Or what's the most thing, uh, the, the most significant thing you to in terms of impact in course design and from your own experience that you can share with the rest of the, 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 uh, the, the participants here? So, okay, so I think I've given everybody about 60 seconds. Uh, sort of just, I see that there's multiple users that are typing, so this is really good. Um, so uh, my my daughter my daughter just came over and she said, "Hey, can you uh, uh, can you sharpen my pencil?" And I was like, "I'm kind of in a session at the moment, so you need to wait." Um, so I won't do that. Uh, but hopefully, this is giving you some time to think about what you want to put in there. Um, uh, maybe it's a resource. Maybe it's a place where you went. Maybe it's a conference you went to recently, um, or maybe it's some person uh, or some key resource that was really really uh, instructive. Um, but Course development is really just, it's a wide, wide area. And I've got some resources to share it toward the end here. Um, and they're not the only resources. There's huge amounts of things that are out there. And I don't think anybody is doing it completely perfect, but I also don't think that it has to be completely perfect. It's it's about going to a place where almost sort of constantly trying to improve. There's always room for improvement, especially when the, the sort of the target is moving, right? Um, and, and, and the pandemic has definitely uh, sort of taught us that the target can move um, in some very significant ways. Okay. So here we go. I think we're about ready. We've got some people that are still multiple users are typing. Uh, that's always kind of good to see. Um, it's kind of like me trying to look and see. I can't have eye contact with everybody, uh, but uh, it tells me that some uh, some thinking is going on up there. And so that's great. Now, hopefully nobody's going to say that they hate pineapple or uh, want pineapple in a course. Uh, hopefully there's some other ideas in there. Okay. Um, so here we go. I'm going to count down from 10, 9, 8, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so what do we got here? Okay, so we've got uh, I'd rather not, it's a must. Oh wait, those are the other, those are the pineapple things. Okay, so I have to get to the other. So, uh, so I gotta find all these uh, answers. I didn't, I didn't scroll during the entire thing. So, so Jordan says he's a big fan of Addy. Uh, we're starting to encourage, Cindy says she's encouraging backward design. Uh, that's good. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, Abby says, I like backward design, but we've also done call and SAMR. SAMR model is huge. I've heard a lot about SAMR model. Love from people that if you're not familiar with the SAMR model, just Google SAMR model instructional design. Um, we've got, uh, 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 see here, we've got UDL. Uh, Terry Golightly is a, a, a big fan of UDL. I am as well. Um, the implementation tends to be somewhat difficult in some cases, but it, it's there's deliberate uh, action being taken when you do UDL. So fantastic there. Um, uh, Abby says, only use a couple of tools at a time, not more than three, not counting the LMS. Yeah, um, there was some ECAR uh, research in the EDUCAUSE report that said, you know, students were overwhelmed by having getting out of outside the LMS and having to go and do this and do this and do this and just become too confusing. Uh, so I think that's a really good tip. Kent says, course usability is key. Can my students easily and consistently access their content? If they can't do that, the rest is well, even good pedagogical design becomes background noise to them. Um, and I think that's true. Um, I often uh, think about that as if I go into a Walmart or a Target, I always know where I can find whatever I need to find because the stores are pretty much all consistent. Um, and so that's really good. So universal design for learning, Terry mentions that again, ensuring all content and assessments are presented in multiple modalities. Um, so there's always a way for everyone to learn. Um, I always uh, kid with Terry about that because I still haven't seen how we can teach uh, and, and, and connect students with the sense of smell yet. Um, and I think that hopefully that will get incorporated into UDL someday. Um, Christy Patty says, yes, course alignment and map table and QM similar to yours, but also connects activities, tests, resources to the learning objectives. I think that's fantastic. And I think in some cases, um, the CD-WAM that we use uh, sort of does that. We just don't expose all of that to our students. So uh, Jenny Higgins says, my curriculum plans are for adult ed, so soft skill development. I have three columns, instructor, group, individual. I try to limit instructor-led time and ensure I include group and individual. Yeah, so opportunities for students to do things on their own and opportunities for students to do things in groups. Um, some students hate groups and some students need that opportunity to work in groups because honestly, that's some part of life, right? Um, Kathy says, develop a set of deliverables with dates so that all involved are held accountable. That's really, really key, right? Um, if you have a course that needs to launch on a particular day or time, you want everybody to be on the same page about when those things need to happen. Um, so that's really good. Uh, Shavana says, this is really just to reiterate something you mentioned. Uh, use Sakai for training employees and have created a template, yeah, of all the training courses that all employees know exactly how to navigate each training course. Also implementing the certification tool has really helped. I'd uh, love to hear, Shavana, about how you guys are doing that. We've done it in one instance, and it seems like it's really working well. Um, but I think that's really key. And maybe that goes along with uh, uh, Martin Ramsey's idea about using badging. Um, Jordan says accessibility improvements help every learner. Yes, absolutely. I can't tell you how many times in uh, some of our foreign language courses and our uh, old history courses where there's terms that are being used. Those terms are put into the captions and a lot of our times, the students will actually pause the captions to see the words spelled correctly and then know that's what they're saying and they can look up that word and find it in the material for the course. So it's really good help. You don't necessarily have to have an assessment. Uh, oh, I dumped really, really fast. Um, you don't have to necessarily have an assessment. I lost my place. Uh, Jim Higgins. This is a bad way to, for universal design for learning. This is really just, uh, so we got that. Uh, you really necessarily have an assessment, essay, or quiz every week, have a lower uh, no stakes activity or a step towards a major assessment. Yeah, so that gives opportunities for students to practice and sort of get to a place where they're doing those higher stakes assessments. Having a few good assessments can be more meaningful than a large number of assessments. Um, uh, so starting at, uh, let's see here, Abby Johnson for this, uh, 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 Alan, I'm not sure I understand your uh, your your idea. Start at eleven. Start at eleven twenty nine. Uh, Abby Johnson for this exercise. Um, uh, Judith says our institution has developed a course template that all faculty use for their syllabi. I think that's key too. Um, I look across our institution, and all of our syllabi don't have a consistent format. And so, typically, when I'm going to help a faculty member, I have to sort of comb through their syllabi to try and figure out, okay, where's things I don't understand how this is. Surely, if students are taking three or four or six courses. 
that's also their issue too, right? And it'd be nice if they could struggle with the content of the course, not how to navigate it, right? Um, so that can be key inside of syllabi as well. Um, so we're also learning, uh, so we also have learning outcomes for each program level, uh, especially the DMN, that's what Judith says. Really, really good comments uh, from everybody. Um, I just want to share a couple of other things. Uh, we're just about here to the end of the session um, and uh, want everybody to, be able to get on to other things. So there's some resources there um, that seemingly have been helpful for me. There's the Oscar uh, rubric that's out there. They've got the design review scorecard for courses, quality matters. Um, there's the LD Fink significant learning experiences. Good. Um, if you have other questions for me, um, I'm Dave Eveland, and uh, I'm glad to reach out, reach out to me and ask questions. Um, I love questions. Um, you can see uh, my emails here. Um, and I'm also available on LinkedIn. Comments, other things that people want to jump on the mic and say, I think our time's just about up. Yeah, about five minutes left, Dave. Okay. Does anybody want to comment on any of the other things that uh, everybody shared as far as uh, things that you are using, things that you're not using? Um, One thing that we do too at Johnson is review and refine courses. They don't, they're, they're not dead as soon as they're first presented. We come back and make it better for each iteration. Yeah. Uh, Terry and I are very familiar with that process. Um, uh, and, and it's somewhat iterative. In some cases, it's, it's irritating because um, it's just like, weren't we just done with that course? Um, but just a course that we just developed, I helped develop uh, for our Bible and teaching faculty uh, or Bible and theology faculty. Um, they finished teaching the course after it was developed and everything else. And the developer came back and said, hey, there's these things that happened as a result of the way the course was taught that I realized they were just oversteps or they were missteps. And so we need to modify those. Now, he did that as a result of um, seeing the course taught himself. Uh, but I also think he used some of the instructional feedback that came in, in the course evaluations. Um, and in fact, uh, Terry, I think I think we have this somewhere. I don't know if it's our mantra, but um, we, we, we always try and say that course for us is not fully developed. It's not it's not a mature course until it's been taught at least three times. And so there's space in that teaching of a three time you know, course, uh, regardless of who the instructor is, for the course to be refined over time. Um, and of course, some of that changes even as the platforms and technology change. Um, uh, and as you know, maybe there's other resources that can be brought to bear. Um, so for example, our business school wanted to use Yellowdig um, because there were some really great tools inside of Yellowdig um, that provided them some analytic feedback about how their students were doing and what they were discussing. Other comments? Well, I really encourage everyone to continue these conversations um, and uh, uh, definitely don't feel like, uh, you know, course development is a, a mountain you cannot conquer, but it is a mountain to continue to climb. Um, and perhaps as you continue to get higher uh, on that mountain, you can see that the, the, the views are a little bit better and you can see where you've been and how far you've come. Um, but also perhaps maybe somewhere up on that mountain, there's a nice place to stop for pizza and then you can choose whether or not you want pizza to have pineapple or not. Have a great rest of the day with the Sky Virtual Conference and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you, Dave.